prudence, really self-determination. It's the ability to choose. And I think that that's what we all should have a right to, and that's what we're all fighting for. Public debate is vital in a democratic society because if the public doesn't take part, then the politicians take over and decide everything for themselves. And a place like the Bali is important because that's where the public gets to say what they think and shape their opinions and listen to debate. It's incredibly important that people continue to speak out in this way. Acknowledge the limitations and taking responsibility for questioning the limitations. With knowledge comes a certain beauty. We are then in a position to take action on that. Particularly in this very noisy, fast culture, what documentary does, I think, is to take time to make meaning. Documentaire films and kunst in het algemeen is soms een plek waar de mening en waar de positie belangeloos is. Je mag er gewoon zijn, je mag leren, en de Bali is zo'n plek. Very warm welcome, everybody here in the Bali, and then a special warm welcome to our honored guest, Amitav Ghosh. Uh, acclaimed Indian novelist here in the Bali. Um, he will receive an honorary doctorate at the University of Maastricht on the 25th of January. And he has been so kind to also pay a visit to the Bali. Gosh is a renowned novelist. He was born in Calcutta, studied social anthropology in New Delhi and Oxford, lives in both India, Europe and the United States. And in his books, such as Sea of Poppies, The Glass Palace, and more recently, his collection of essays in The Great Derangements, he writes on cultural identity, post-colonialism, and climate change. His work has been translated into 25 languages and nominated for the Man Booker Prize. And he also writes for The New Yorker, The New Republic, and The New York Times, among many others. And this afternoon, he will speak about climate change a topic he started to interest in as a writer more and more in the last couple of years. And in 2016, he published his non-fictional work on the topic, The Great Derangement, in which he writes about climate change as a crisis of imagination that relates to literary fiction, Western thinking, and global politics. So give them him a very big hand. Amish Gosh, thank you so much. Thank you, Lena. Thank you. Anitav, you're going to speak for about 15 minutes or so, and then we will uh, broaden up our conversation in the chairs. And then, of course, I will also invite the audience to ask questions. Sure. Thank Pro you. Yours. Thank you. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here in the Bali. It's my third time here over, I think, maybe 10 years. And it's always been wonderful to be here. And my thanks to Malayne for uh, inviting me uh, to come back. <coughs> So Leonard uh, referred to my book uh, 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 of essays. It's called The Great Derangement. And when the book came out, my publishers made uh, a, a, sh a short film uh, to sort of introduce it. So I'm going to play you that film. Climate events are very, very difficult to write about. Extreme events, improbable events are very difficult to write about. And I know this myself as a writer. I had an extraordinary encounter with a very, very uh, strange weather event. I didn't even recognize what it was because, you know, we, didn't, we in India have very little awareness of um, phenomena like tornadoes. For years afterwards, I tried to write about this event in, uh, in a sort of meaningful way. I tried to sort of even think of incorporating it in my, in my books and novels, and I always found myself struggling with it. I'm a marine ecologist. I've been working in the system quite some years now. And what I can tell you is uh, the oceans are being hit in various ways that you cannot even imagine. Just look at the cost of our seafood production. You know, what does it mean to produce those fish on your table? You know, now the major gear that's used to catch and produce a lot of our seafood is uh, trawl fishers. Now, this is a technique that is really unselective. It's destructive. Uh, you target a few species, but you pretty much catch an entire ecosystem in your net. 
Now this not just obviously has an impact on the ecosystem, but it also has a huge impact on livelihoods of small scale fishing communities that depend on a lot of these fish species and also a long term sort of survival of that fishery itself. You have all these multiple stressors acting on a marine system okay, that have an impact, as I said, not just on ecosystems, but also on livelihoods. And you sort of uh, have the overarching umbrella of climate change. Now that is like the recipe for a perfect storm. Just this year, this incredible heat wave that we've had across Northern India and across Central India, I mean, it's astonishing, unprecedented. It's been a problem modeling the monsoon. So even now, climate models don't all agree on whether the monsoon rainfall will increase or decrease. But what all models agree about is that the frequency of extremes is going to change, which means the frequency of droughts and excess rainfall years, that is going to be change. For example, in 2015, you know that uh, we are sitting in Maharashtra. In Maratwada region of Maharashtra, more than 1,000 farmers committed suicide. And you and I were paying more than rupees 200 per kilo of turdal. Now, these are all adverse impacts of the drought. So the question arises, are we adapting to this? And after all, unlike unexpected effects of climate change, droughts are nothing new. We have experienced droughts for centuries. So we should have been able to adapt. Are we adapting to it? Unfortunately, it appears that we are not adapting to it. And still there are very large impacts on agriculture, economy and so on. If you consider that, you know, Parliament just a couple of weeks ago finally held uh, some uh, a session uh, to talk about the drought and only 80 MPs turned up to discuss what is the most single most important uh, thing that is happening uh, in this country right now. I mean, it really does in a way defy belief. The inconvenient truth in climate change is not that climate change is happening, but that climate change is about sharing the economic growth between nations and within nations. I mean, if you look at the most recent uh, sorts of um, uh, weather-related events around India, you know, so for example, these terrible deluges that have happened in Mumbai in these last uh, eight to ten years, this terrible deluge that we saw in Chennai, uh, you know, last year. I mean, uh, you know, those things are, are on our doorstep. What does it mean for our cities? It means that we need to design our systems so well that you have much better systems of sanitation. You have no water retention that happens in your cities. You're able to design your green areas in ways in which your green spaces can absorb the extreme heat that happens. You need to design your city so that you can hold the water when it falls. Over the last uh, 150 years or so, the, the, the direction that literature and literary fiction has taken has carried it away from all sorts of natural engagements. It's carried it more and more towards abstractions of various kinds. It's become, uh, literature has become more and more sort of focused on, uh, on urban areas, on, uh, on the urban experience, on urbanity as such. That to me raises many, many interesting questions. How is it that literature, which in many ways has always historically dealt with the most important issues in the human condition, you know, uh, uh, why is it that literature has turned away from this? In that sense, you could say that, uh, you know, the whole, the whole trajectory of fiction uh, is also imbricated in uh, the same kind of derangement that carries people closer and closer to the sea, where they're so uh, exposed to all these uh, natural impacts. Today, we are voiceless, we are powerless. We are not asking our leaders to step up their game because it concerns us, our present, and our children's future. It concerns the survival of humankind. So, um I'm, I'm a novelist, basically, uh, you know, I'm a novelist, but I've also been a journalist. Uh, <clears throat> and people often ask me, how did you start thinking about uh, climate change? 
And uh, my answer to this always is that uh, I came to climate change through a book that I wrote, uh, that I started working on in the year 2000. The book was published in English uh, uh, as the, uh, the Hungry Tide. And the book is set uh, in a part of India called the Sundarbans. This is where basically the Sundarbans are. Uh, that is the Sundarbans. This, uh, it's the world's largest mangrove forest. It's spread over Bangladesh and India, two thirds in Bangladesh and maybe one third uh, in India. So this area is a, is a completely extraordinary region in, in, very, many, in very many ways. Uh, a, mangrove for, uh, a mangrove forest uh, is really nothing like any other forest that you can imagine. And uh, just to give you a sense of the sort of uh, place that it is, every day the tidal, uh, the tidal fall you know, varies between uh, uh, six to eight, uh, to eight feet, that's uh, two to three meters. So there's a huge sort of, it's very hard. You, you have to go everywhere in the Sundarbans by boat and uh, because it's a very poor area, incredibly poor, it's, uh, I, I think it's one of the poorest parts of the world. So to go anywhere there, you have to take these boats. And uh, this is what the interior of the mangrove forest looks like. It's uh, really just uh, huge stretches of mud uh, with these, uh, with these uh, uh, mangroves growing everywhere. It's an it's a area that's very hostile to, hum uh, to human beings. If you, look at the, if you look at the soil over here, you'll see that it's got these spikes sticking out of it. These are pneumatophores, that's how, the, uh, that's how mangroves reproduce. And it makes it very difficult to even walk in these places because these are actually quite sharp. And if you set your foot on them, I mean, you can't go in there wearing, uh, wearing boots because they'll get stuck in the mud. So you have to go in there uh, barefoot and you can very easily stick your, uh, uh, impale your feet on one of these uh, new metaphors. Uh, as I said, uh, people there are incredibly poor, so these are the sorts of boats that they manage on. This is the kind of uh, the, uh, this is what the mud flats look when the tides when the tide is uh, when the tide is down. In its own way, it's a very beautiful it's a very beautiful landscape as well, as you can see. I mean, uh, you know, the rivers are vast. Uh, with some of them, you can't see from one bank to another. They're so uh, they're so vast. And there are thousands of these rivers. And of course, the mangrove forest is uh, home to these marine crocodiles, uh, which are, can grow to like a huge, a huge length, uh, six, seven meters, and they're, uh, they're very, very ferocious. And uh, uh, the Sundarbans are best known for their tiger, for the tigers. Uh, these are Bengal tigers. Uh, these tigers. Uh, almost all of them are man-eaters. They eat, uh, they hunt and eat people. Uh, and uh, I know it sounds extraordinary to say that, and people sometimes think it's because of encroachment of humans on forests. But actually, way back, uh, even in the 19th century, when there were very few people in this forest, uh, I, I mean, we have statistics <coughs> from colonial records. Uh, you know, over five, six-year periods, the tigers would kill as many as 10,000 people. Um, and as you can see here, this is how people live. They collect firewood. While they're collecting this firewood, they're extremely vulnerable to tigers. So even back then, in 2000, when I was, uh, uh, you know, when I was living there, I, I have a long connection with the Sundarbans, but in, two, uh, in 2000, I went there and spent a long time there, just trying to see what was happening. It was very clear back then that uh, th this area was already uh, feeling the impact of climate change. Uh, there was salt water intrusion, sea level rise. You could see the harvests being uh, being affected. So that was where I started um, thinking about uh, uh, um, about climate change. But I'm going to uh, so uh, you know when I started writing these essays, I went back to my notes of that period, and amongst these notes, I also found uh, some old footage that I had shot with a camera. You know. Um, one of those ancient video cameras. So I made a, I made a little film about it. Uh, you know, I edited it down to a few minutes. And I'm going to show that to you because it's actually very hard to have a sense of what life is like in the Sundarbans. Uh, 
Uh, and you'll see it's, the Sundarbans are extraordinary, not just because of uh, the, the natural landscape, but also because there's an extraordinary culture in which all sorts of currents uh, mix and merge. So here, there we are. ঘেরা <laughs> ওই দোনে কাঙড়া ধরলে এবার এই জালতে দিয়ে কাটিয়ে এভাবে তুলতে হবে পাগের ভয় করে না হ্যাঁ করে আমাদেরই না হম 
আমরা করি কেন যে আমাদের এই পূজা জঙ্গলে আমরা থাকতে হয় ওই মাকে বলে আমরা মা চরম ধরে নিয়ে জঙ্গল চলি এই জন্য আমরা হিন্দু শাস্ত্রে মাকে পূজা করি আদি মন্ত্র পূজা হচ্ছে মুসলমানের আমাদের কালি হরি দুর্গা শিব আমরা করতে পারি যেটা আমরা করি কেন না আমরা জঙ্গলে চলি এই কারণে আমরা পূজা করি মাকে ভক্তি করি মার ভক্তির কারণে আমরা এই পূজাটা করি এই বনৌদ এই বাড়ু করি এটা আমাদের এ এখন আমাদের পেশা হয়ে গেছে ওই মায়ের পূজা আর ওদের কিরাম ওই মসজিদ করে আছে সেখানে যাবে নামাজের খানায় কি নামাজ করে পূজা করবো ওই একদিনই নীলা খেলা আজকে কালকের হয়ে গেছে ওদের পূজা হ্যাঁ আচ্ছা বোন বিবির পূজা হ্যাঁ জঙ্গলে তুলে দিয়েছিল বাবা Uh, as you can see, the extraordinary thing about this landscape is that it's not just a mingling of, uh, of um, land, sea, water, mangrove. It also has this, this incredible culture where you know, completely different traditions are mixed and merged, and, and it creates its own reality. Now, in 2009, this uh, area was hit by a cyclone called Cyclone Aila. And this cyclone had an absolutely devastating effect on the region. So, uh, uh, you know, huge stretches of land were inundated by salt water. Lots of places that were fertile were now turned saline. Uh, effectively, millions of people have been already displaced from this area. Large islands. Uh, you've all heard of, uh, you know, islands like Tuvalu in the, uh, in the Pacific, which are... Uh, which are set to drown in uh, maybe 10, 10 years or so, 10, 20 years, I don't know exactly. But, uh, you know, the total population of Tuvalu is something like 10,000. Whereas one island in the Sundarbans, which went underwater, displaced uh, 500,000 people, simply because the numbers are such. So for all these reasons, uh, you know, Especially for me, because I'm from this area, uh, the, uh, these issues became very, very pressing. And finally, I sat down uh, and wrote this book and, uh, you know, uh, produced <laughs> various essays, which we are now going to talk about. Thank you. Amit, of course, please uh, take a chair. And thank, thank you, you for uh, the introduction about a land which is not so unfamiliar for us uh, yes. as being in Holland. It's a big delta. Of course, this is a much bigger delta than we are, uh, we are living in. But if you go to the Biesbos, which is a little bit in the south, it has exactly the same sort of tide system, which has been over the years, um, well, sort of abolished because of the new dikes and dams after the flute we had in 1953. Yes. Um, so the sort of um, effect uh, is a sort of known. And also, I thought it's quite ironic. We have campaigns here to save the Bengali tiger. We do a lot of, uh, of campaigning by the World Wildlife uh, Organization to raise money to help this tiger survive. And you're telling us that he is a pain in the ass for the locals? <laughs> uh, you know, it's a curious thing. It's not that simple. I mean, you would think that the people there, because they're actually hunted by the tiger, would feel a lot of antipathy towards the tiger. But it's not that. You know, um, people who have lived uh, with animals uh, in a very close relationship, uh, these relationships are always much, much more complicated than they appear. So uh, for them, you know, the, the tiger is not just an animal, it's a, it's a being. It's a being who thinks, uh, you know, it's a being who has a presence in the world, uh, and it's a being that they respect, uh, deeply, deeply respect. And, uh, you know, when someone is killed by the tiger, uh, they always say that, you know, it's because they got greedy, uh, because they wanted more. So, you know, the whole idea of this particular relationship of uh, Bon Bibi is that Bon Bibi is thought to maintain the balance between the forest uh, and the zone, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, between... It's beautiful that you, that, you, that you tell this, because 
Is this to you also a metaphor for the way you see the balance between humankind and Earth? And the fact that you say, especially in literature, we sort of went away from that. There are not too many stories anymore where this sort of balance is being described. Absolutely. Uh, we completely diverged from that. Uh, I think especially in literature, especially if you look at the literature of the late 20th century, uh, the presence of uh, you know, the non-human, the presence of, um, uh, the presence of uh, ecology really dwindles to nothing. I mean, if you look around, at, uh, if you look around today at uh, the sort of work that occupies the mainstream of the literary landscape, the main, uh, the, you know, the foreground, it's always about, um, uh, you know, most of the stories are set in cities. Uh, overwhelmingly, I think, the, uh, the issues that prevail are identity issues, mm -hmm. you know, to do with one form of identity and the other, or the other. And uh, most of all, these stories are deeply individualistic, uh, you know, whereas if you think of earlier forms of writing, if you think of the work of, say, uh, well, Cooperus, <laughs> for example, mm -hmm. Uh, or, uh, you know, you think of Herman Melville, or you even think of John Steinbeck or Tolstoy. Uh, there's a completely different approach, uh, you know, to the, um, uh, to the novel, where you're really thinking of collective predicaments. Uh, and you write yourself, why does climate change cast a much smaller shadow on literature than it does in the world? Is it perhaps too well to stream to be navigated in the accustomed barkers of narration? But the truth, as it now widely, widely acknowledged, is that we have entered a time when the wealth has become the norm. If certain literary forms are unable to negotiate these waters, then they will have failed, and their failures will have to be counted as an aspect of the broader Im imaginative and cultural failure that lies at the heart of the climate crisis. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, the novel comes into being uh, with the birth of bourgeois society. You know, bourgeois society literally gives birth to the novel. I mean, it was bourgeois people who had the, A, the leisure to write novels, the leisure to read novels. And the novel is very much, uh, you know, novels are very much about the manners and customs of, uh, you know, bourgeois society. So um, this, uh, this, this particular form, will it be able to uh, confront uh, the challenges that we face today, which are absolutely going to undermine all those tidy assumptions, are already undermining them, as we can see. Well, why do you think literature has a task doing that? Uh, because, uh, you know, as writers, writers, uh, you know, going back to Homer, uh, you know, we've always written about the great challenges that face society, that face, our, face us. So for me, you know, I must say that I, as a writer of novels, I don't delude myself that my books uh, will make people change their minds, uh, you know, and work in different ways. But I do feel that it is, uh, for me, a challenge as a writer to try and understand how to represent these problems, uh, how to represent these issues uh, within my work. On the other hand, we have, over the last decades, a lot of science fiction um, focused on these issues. The fact that Earth has, to, uh, has become too bewildered, too... Uh, too hostile, and then we leave this planet in search for others and better places, or a planet which has been completely frozen because of climate change and so on. There are so many of those stories. Uh, yes, there's a lot of science fiction, and perhaps there'll be more and more science fiction. And very imaginative. Yes, I like science fiction. But, uh, you know, when we say that climate change uh, is... Uh, when we lump climate change on Earth, with science fiction, what are we really saying? What we are saying, you know, that uh, climate change is like writing about little green men or, you know, writing about space aliens or something like that. And this is the problem, really, that, you know, climate change is here and now. It's knocking on our doorsteps. It's everywhere. We feel it all around us. And uh, uh, how can we say that it should be a part of some fantasy world? It's not. And I think that's a real problem that, you know, uh, I've... I'm, I, I completely love science fiction, so it's not that I'm trying to say that science fiction is the wrong place to deal with this. But when we, are, when we think that any novel that deals with climate change automatically becomes science fiction, what we are really doing is that we are marginalizing this subject. We are sort of pushing it out of the, of the real world that we live in. 
On the other hand, I can imagine that a lot of writers think climate change as a topic is just simply too big. So they maybe focus on parts of it, like pollution or uh, the fact that there is a big change in, in, in landscape and people have to flat away. There are so many novels based upon those sort of stories. Uh, yeah, I, I think people do feel that it's a very big thing, but <coughs> and it is, it's huge. But think about, say, your neighbor, who may be Somali, and may have had to leave because of a drought. You know, I mean, just like uh, if you go to Venice now, uh, the language you hear, I, I, I think more than any other after Italian, is Bengali. And uh, Venice is completely, all the work, all the, the entire working class of Venice is Bangladeshi, you know. Many of them actually displaced by climate change. So, I mean, the fact that you have your Somali neighbor or your Bangladeshi neighbor, that's not a vast thing. You know, it's a small thing. It's the sort of experience that you have. It's the sort of experience that we all have in our lives. That is also an aspect of this, uh, of this great movement that we are seeing across the world. So do you think that writers, especially novelists, should aim to write novels really about the more systematic approach of the change? No, I, I, listen, I don't think that one can ever be prescriptive. Uh, uh, far be it from me to tell writers, you must, uh, you must do this, you must do that. I think uh, the, the whole point is that writers should be able to use their ingenuity uh, to write about these subjects as they see best. What I do feel is very important is that when they do produce this work, it should not be marginalized. And there again, I think uh, actually this year, last year, was a major inflection point because Richard Power, Powers' book, The Overstory, uh, a truly wonderful, magnificent novel, uh, was actually, I think, one of the first books ab about these wider subjects, which uh, found a place in a mainstream literary fiction, which was shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize. And I think that was a very important moment, a very important inflection point. So what you're saying is maybe these books are written, but they are not published or not being, yes. let's say, campaigned for. Exactly. The books are written, many very good books exist, but, you know, it's not just the writer, it's the entire ecosystem of the, liter of the literary and artistic worlds. So if you actually pick up the major, I, I, I'm speaking of English because that, that's the tradition I know, uh, if you pick up the major literary reviews, you know, they review non-fiction books on climate change. But almost never do they review uh, um, novels about climate change. They just assume that those are not serious. Mm -hmm. They're not serious fiction. So th what it calls into question is, what does the bourgeois think of as serious? I mean, if you think that the rising sea is not going to kill you, I mean, uh, <laughs> oh, that's not serious. What is serious? That's a good question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, you are talking about the bourgeois uh, citizen n not being aware. On the other hand, uh, I think you say it in one of the documentaries I, I saw about writing this book, is that there is also, of course, the feeling that you just simply cannot change th a thing. You cannot change the system. You are in a sort of a waiting modus. Yes. Uh, you know, I, for one, I, I feel my, the possibility of my being an activist uh, is over. I have the greatest respect for activists, and especially for the younger generations, you know, who will be dealing with this problem. Uh, you know, the problem is only going to get worse and worse, and the younger people are, the more they're going to face this. And across Europe now, you can see there's a huge movement. People recognize, uh, young people recognize that, you know, people of, of my generation, of your generation, we've left them. I think our generations will be remembered as the most hated generations in human history. Thank you so much. We have created this problem. We have left it to them. We've lived off the fat of the land. And we are leaving them with a, di with a dwindling world. But that, I think, forces us to talk a little bit more about the system itself as well. And you're addressing that in your book, uh, in the chapter about politics. I mean, you're a part of the system as well. I mean, you write a beautiful book. Uh, of course, it's been campaigned for. And you campaign for the book yourself. You fly around the world, uh, making your CO2 print even bigger. And that, that's, all, I think, what a lot of people feel about. You're still, you cannot escape the structure you live in. Yeah, and I think that's the problem. You know, when we reduce this to, um, uh, to sort of individual choices, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, that's really what neoliberalism has pushed us into, 
always thinking of these things in terms of individual choices. Because really, what we do need is structural changes. Uh, what structural changes? Well, everybody has a different set of uh, structural changes to advocate. Uh, I'm not uh, necessarily able to address all of those. But I do know there's one little corner of the world that I can change, which is the world of the novel. Mm -hmm. You know, so that for me is the fundamental uh, is the fundamental challenge. You know, because I've had a life I've spent a lifetime writing. So for me, uh, really, ultimately, it comes down to my own practice as a writer. How do I write? What do I? In what ways can I confront this uh, this issue from uh, the particular subject position of a writer? Okay, but the writer is also a person who lives, who makes decisions as a consumer. Uh, Oh no, I've, I'm not going to. I'm not going to get into that. I don't think you can solve this problem by changing light bulbs. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not going to do it. Because in the first place, you know, a lot of these, these issues have to do with um, things like, uh, well, take for instance something that is known to energy economists as the Jeevan's paradox. You know, so we are always told that. It, so what hap what happens actually? People find, economists have found, is that. Uh, efficiencies in energy use actually lead to greater energy use. You know, uh, it's the same thing as the paperless office paradox. Mm -hmm. You know, when uh, the internet started working, everybody thought people would use less paper. In fact, we find they use much more paper. So, you know, everything that is touted to us as an efficiency put forward by the market ultimately seems to have exactly the opposite effect. And so, how do we deal with, let's say, the more positive? remarks which has been over the last week, for example, being, being published as well, the enormous effects which, which, has global, which globalization has led us towards um, the, uh, the reduce of child mortality, for example, the enormous race uprise of Asian middle class, I think for the individual it means a very big change in positive. <laughs> you know, uh, this uh, writer Nicholas Talib has a very uh, interesting uh, analogy. He says, you know, for the turkey, everything seems really good. There's a man who comes and gives them lots of food, and he enjoys this food, and the days go by really well, and then one day it's Thanksgiving. You know, and that's it. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's it. <laughs> that's over for the turkey. Or else you could say, you know, it's uh, our position right now, especially when we try to fit these things into a narrative of progress, is that uh, really we're like, it's like being in the part of the Titanic that's going up. And you say, oh, how nice it is, the, how, what a nice view from up here. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we know that, uh, you know, this is not going to last. I mean, we can already see. But this, that's exactly also the problem for a lot of individuals around the globe, that, that there is always this narrative of fear. Uh, you also use it like the Turkey or the, the Titanic. It's always the idea, you know, we're going down anyway. Yes, absolutely. And uh, really, why should we be afraid of fear? You look at the, great, uh, at the great documents of humankind. You know, you look at, say, the scriptures, you look at the Bible, you look at, uh, 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 you look at the Iliad, the Odyssey. Human beings have always lived in fear. We should be fearful because we live, uh, um, we don't live on an inert planet. It's our fear that makes us respond to this world. It's this bourgeois idea of everything always getting better, that is actually the, the being overturned by the, uh, by the planet. It's the planet that's acting to show us that uh, uh, this is a delusion. It's a delusion uh, born of a certain moment in history. So are you saying we should be more aware of the hostility of the planet and be more um, thankful for every day living in a sort of uh, well, level basic element? It's not the hostility of the planet. The planet is utterly indifferent to us. Mm -hmm. You know, the planet doesn't care about us. It's utterly indifferent to us. It, has, it harbors no malice towards us and no goodwill towards us. And the planet will live on. You know, the planet will survive. Everything will survive. Ev everything will be good. I mean, you know, if you want to look at it the other way around, I mean... Well, you know, let's have a look at a, at a quote I found from Albert Einstein. Let's talk a little bit about that. Let's, can we have it? A human being is part of the whole cult bias universe, a part limited in time and space. 
He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings, and sometimes separated from the rest, a kind of an optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to the affection for a few per persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature and its beauty. Um, I, I don't know if all living creatures are necessarily so, uh, are so well disposed towards us. I mean, uh, you know, if you think of, let's say, our relationship with trees, you know, uh, now we know that trees communicate with each other, that forests have ways of thinking. Now, if you think about it, you know, when we regard ourselves in relation to a tree, we think we have the power because we can chop down a tree. But, you know, trees, if they think, think in very much longer terms. So maybe they are gardening us, you know? Because imagine a future when, uh, when humans are extinct. For trees, it'll be really wonderful because they'll have a soil which is much enriched with billions of decomposing human bodies. <laughs> so, I, you know, those are possibilities. Oh, for sure. They wait and smell. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> But if you, if you talk a little bit more about politics, I mean, you talk about it uh, in your book as well. You say that we should have a new sort of narrative, a political na narrative, which, which is based much more on imagination, much more also, I hope, uh, of, of hope. Is that where you aim for? Look, uh, obviously, in the, in the uh, there are two aspects of this, uh, of this issue. One is... Uh, long-term mitigation, and the other is preparedness. And we depend upon <laughs> politics and governments to look to both those things. I don't know that any government in the world is looking really seriously at long-term mitigation, but there are several governments in the world which are looking towards preparedness. And the government of Holland, I mean, you, you are fortunate to live in a state where this is taken very seriously by the political system, by leaders. Well, at least there is debate about it. Let's, let's put it up. No, no, they've prepared, uh, they've prepared extensive plans. They have the floating houses, etc. So, I mean, you know, that, uh, that's something. Another state which is uh, really preparing very hard for climate change is Singapore, uh, in China as well. So different political systems are having different responses, but some are having no response at all. And uh, one such is India. Uh, the United States, uh, basically country, uh, you know, Australia. So there's a, there's a whole spectrum. It's not just, it's not just a single, single thing. It's interesting because if we go back to the land you have described and have shown us in the film, you can, you can, you can expect that we can maybe learn from that. The fact that those people live very close to the land and the environment, that they're in a hostile environment but still able to survive. Is that, is that a, some sort of thinking you, you can learn from in a political sense? Is that some, some sort of thinking which we have lost? It might have served as a model, you know, 20, 30 years ago, but it, uh, it's no longer the case. I mean, those very people who live on that land can no longer make a living from that land. You know, because a large part of them make a living by fishing. Uh, fish stocks are declining catastrophically, uh, you know, especially in the Bay of Bengal. The Bay of Bengal is a very important body of water. People don't recognize this, but you know, one out of every four people on Earth lives in a country that abuts on the Bay of Bengal. And the Bay of Bengal, literally, its, uh, its fish stocks sustain something like 300 million people. Now, what has happened in these last few, uh, last few years is that these huge dead zones have appeared in the middle of the Bay of Bengal. So, you know, nothing can live in these oceanic dead zones. So fishermen, uh, fisher, uh, uh, fishermen are losing their livelihood at an incredible rate. It's creating lots of internal migration inside countries like India. I mean, uh, you are feeling the effects of migration in, the, uh, uh, in Europe, but actually the far greater numbers of uh, migrants are moving inside Asia. And uh, these are people, who, you know, who are abandoning one way of life and becoming, say, peasants or, uh, you know, day laborers and constructors, stuff. Constructors, yeah. Yeah, uh, construction workers. Yeah. But then back to you as a novelist. I can imagine that it could be a challenge for you that you can say, okay, you know what? I will take up the task. I will write a more positive narrative like 
the Einstein idea of embracing the universe and to feel more in balance with everything as a, as a human being. Is that something which you think is possible? Um, well, I think that uh, once you start uh, reading about climate change, once you became, uh, become aware of what is happening in the world, it's impossible to go back. I mean, I don't think I can ever write anything now uh, which doesn't uh, engage in one way or the other with climate change. And with these, uh, I mean, the, you know, we call it climate change, but it's just reality. It's the reality that we now inhabit, you know. Um, well, but my humble question would be, can this be also have a positive narrative? Is there a way out? You know, I think <laughs> I would say that that's a part of the problem. Uh, to ask questions like that, is there a solution? Uh, you know, we have to give up this idea that there are simple solutions, that there are these uh, golden bullets. It's that kind of thinking that has brought us to where we are. You know, it's these technological quick fixes, each of which turns out to be worse than the next. So I, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I for one don't think, uh, think about it in that way at all. Well, I'm not putting it in a way of, let's say, a new technical solution, but if you say we need imagination and we need literature to um, embrace this problem and to research this problem, I have this humble question as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a reader to a writer, help me, give us a positive story. But uh, if, you, if you know what you want, why are you asking me? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you should do it yourself. <laughs> okay, that's an interesting answer. <laughs> you know Yuval Harari, right? Sorry? You know Yuval yeah. Harari with his famous novel, well, non-fiction, Homo sapiens. Maybe that's the other way around. He's just telling us a big truth, truth about ourselves. Yes, I think certainly one of the things that we are going to have to do is rethink the generic boundaries, you know? Uh, what does fiction do? What does non-fiction do? Well, Harari simply puts it like this. He says, you know, humankind, face it, you are the big destroyer for already 30,000 years. Wherever you come, <laughs> species go away. Yeah, all the great um, megafauna, everything. And the real, the real... So in a way, what he says, you are just failed animals. You said it. <laughs> what do you think about it? Well, as you also said, we've lowered life expectancy. <laughs> and so, I mean, we've uh, increased life expectancy, increased uh, lowered child mortality rates. So, uh, you know, I guess it's w uh, what you choose to look at. Well, how do you see it? Are we failed animals? Are we conquering, conquering air Earth wherever we come? I think one of the problems with... That, Are we the problem? I think one of the problems with that kind of approach is precisely this species thinking, you know, that uh, we always think in terms of ourselves as a single species, whereas we are not. You know, 90% of, uh, of our body weight comes from, uh, not 90%, but a very large, uh, a very large, uh, a significant uh, proportion of our body weight is actually other organisms, bacteria, you know. Similarly, the, in the past, we've always lived not as a single species, but, uh, you know, in collaborative endeavors with other sorts of uh, species, you know, whether it be wheat or rice or whatever. So to think of ourselves, I think that is a, one, of the, a, one of the problems that, you know, if we go down, it's not just we, it's a, it's a whole collaboration that, that will collapse. And it's already collapsing, uh, you know. I could give you examples, but... No, go on. <laughs> well... You know, in 2016, when, this, uh, when my book came out, there was a huge drought in the center, center of India in an area called Bundelkhand. And there was a time when uh, literally like a million people were leaving uh, every, every week. Now, you know, India has always been a water-stressed area. So these peasants who lived in this area, you know, I use this word peasant, whereas in fact what we should call them is professors, because they had a, a sort of enormous library of knowledge in their heads on how to get uh, sustenance out of the soil. They had this library of knowledge in their heads, but they also had a biota, you know, which made it possible for them to live collaboratively with that environment. 
So I saw this very interesting uh, uh, interview with an old farmer in this area. They asked, you know, he was talking to this journalist, and he said, you know, we've always had droughts. But in the past, when we had droughts, we would eat certain, kind of, uh, certain kinds of weeds, you know, and that would get us through the drought. He said, I can still eat this weed, but my children and my grandchildren can't digest it. So what it means is that they've lost the enzymes. They've lost the microbiota, which actually allowed them uh, you know, to subsist in collaborative endeavors with, uh, with the world. So that's what I mean. It's not just that the outside is collapsing. It's also our insides are collapsing. You know? So it's we have retracted ourselves too much from the nature, from the environment. We've certainly launched upon some sort of experiment uh, which makes these, um, that kind of collaborative survival increasingly impossible. So for these people in the Sundarbans, for example, uh, you know, the fish stocks are collapsing, uh, their, uh, their, their grain stocks are collapsing because the land is saturated with salt. So it's, uh, it's not just us, it's an it's entire sort of cycle of, um, you know, it's, it's this whole collaborative cycle that is perhaps uh, not headed in a good direction. We look forward to the future. <laughs> because that would be my, 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 my last main question. I mean, you are addressing this for a long amount of years already. How do you look upon the upcoming years? You were here in 2012. You were saying, for example, the European Union. That's a good example of organizing a new sort of positive reality. Well, we are seven years further and we see a collapse of the Union, we see a lot of debate about environmental uh, um, measures to be taken, but because of economic, in, uh, uh, economic uh, uh, restraints we, we are not willing to do it and so on. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned that. Actually, you know, at that point I really thought that in a, in a endeavor like the European Union lay some sort of answer to this problem, you know, some way of collectively approaching uh, uh, issues of climate change and environment. And I think now we see that actually uh, climate change is outrunning us. You know, you look at the world today, it's actually unrecognizable from six years ago. You know, six years ago, would anyone have said that uh, mig migration is going to fundamentally destabilize Europe? that is going to fundamentally destabilize America. Who would have thought it? But, you know, these great movements of people are very closely tied to climate change. And we can see the effects of climate change have already outrun our ability to cope. They're profoundly undermining, uh, you know, all our collective uh, forms of government. I mean, you've seen that uh, um, in, uh, in Europe, in the Netherlands. I mean, literally, the, the Europe that I spoke in in 2012 is not the Europe of today. And you can see the, way, the direction in which it's headed. And what's that? Well, you know, we can see that it's uh, going to be increasingly, you know, the direction in which it's headed, I would say, is mainly confusion. You know, uh, the idea that uh, there was once some sort of collective approach to these problems, and I really felt at that moment in time that that was one. But one of the reasons why it has failed also is because that effort was uh, led by a certain kind of neoliberal uh, approach, you know, which has now been decisively rejected uh, across Europe by large numbers of people. And you're not thinking that there's still some sort of uh, way out? For example, last week it was said that um, there are more um, new green investments being made than, than even before, the amount of millions invested in green solutions, in green structures, especially in Europe, is, ex is extremely high. I, I saw uh, a critique of that study, which showed uh, that, in fact, uh, in percentage terms, uh, there, there hasn't been an exponential increase in, uh, uh, in renewable energies. Secondly, um, uh, the, you know, it's completely consistent over a 10-year period that the proportions of uh, fossil fuel energy and renewable energies haven't changed in relation to each other. Uh, finally, you know, we think of renewable energy as a magic bullet. 
But renewable energy comes with its own costs. You know, I mean, what, what is a wind tower? It's a giant stack of cement. Cement is the, sec is the uh, second most uh, uh, polluting thing there is because, uh, you know, the very process of making cement involves huge uh, releases of carbon, uh, of CO2. So just putting up one of those things is not necessarily an answer, you know? I mean, it's a, it requires enormous resources of its own. Uh, you look at solar panels, I mean, yeah, solar panels are wonderful, but uh, they require rare earths. Rare earths, uh, to mine rare earths requires enormous, um, enormous uh, uh, quantities of water, enormous amounts of pollution. So I really, this is again one of the problems, you know, we speak of the solutions in this way as if there's some sort of technological fix, and I just don't see that there is. I think it's beautiful. You bring us as a novelist into the darkest of places. And if I ask where to go, you say, well, look for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not in the business of, um, I'm not in the business of uh, providing solutions. I mean, there are lots and lots of people who are economists and technocrats uh, who do that. But I'll tell you, I, I think the person who's uh, spoken on this subject uh, in the most accessible way and the most sensible way is... Uh, uh, is the Pope. I think uh, Laudato Si is si simply the most important document written to date on climate change. And it's a document that's uh, imbued with a profound humanity. And a very severe, uh, how you say, um, uh, no, uh, severe focus on greed. Yes, exactly. It's the tiger. Uh, the t uh, Sundarbans people never think of the tiger as greedy. <laughs> it's the humans who are greedy. <laughs> Well, it's like the people you spoke to say, we have been maybe too greedy, and then the tiger comes. Yes, that's right. That's right. Okay, thank you so much, Amitav Ghosh. Thank you, Leonard. Um, there's quite some room for questions. I think it's important to, uh, to bring the audience into the conversation. Um, who can I give uh, the floor? And of course, it's important that you make a real question, okay? Not in 1878 and then your whole research. No, really pinpointing on what you want to ask. Who can I give the floor? Who's opening the ball? Crystal clear or just shut up, down, totally negative? Okay, some, one person here. Let's see if I can reach you through this path. Nou, zo gaat het wel. Zeg maar even wie je bent en een kwestie. Ik uh, don't speak any Dutch. Ik spreek geen Dutch. Je was op een gegeven moment de verschillen tussen fiction en non-fiction en dan de conversatie ging elders. Ik zou me graag curious hoe je judge de impact van of, of literatuur of misschien van art in general in plaats van non-fiction of science. I do think uh, that, uh, you know, especially in relation to these issues, uh, nonfiction has emerged as a singularly powerful uh, uh, genre, you know. The writing of uh, people like Elizabeth Colbert, for example, Rebecca Solnit, uh, I mean, they have a huge impact, and they're also very beautifully written pieces, you know. Uh, as artifacts, uh, they're very beautiful and very satisfying. So uh, I think we are going to see all sorts of uh, you know, genre breakdowns, and we're going to see uh, new forms of um, media emerging, you know, which uh, perhaps are better suited to addressing these questions. And I think that's already underway. You can, s you can see that. So the beautiful mixture of, uh, of sorts of literature coming together. Yes. Other, other questions? I saw someone here. Yeah. Brilliant. So um, this is linked to this really beautiful concept you were talking about previously about, you know, how trees, if they really are, um, they're outthinking us in a way. And it actually, it's about man and ego. I'm specifically not saying woman and ego here. But uh, could you talk a little bit more about that, about... Um, the dichotomy between the fact that me, myself, today is the most important thing in the world because I exist and the world exists because I exist, 
versus having to come out of that and think about the world actually exists regardless of me. And how have you dealt with that? Thank you. That's a very interesting question. Uh, I think it's one of the fundamental questions that uh, uh, that a new generation of philosophers um, uh, is confronting. I mean, and basically, you know, all the fingers point back towards Descartes. You know, the whole idea of cogito ergo sum, the idea that we exist uh, purely um, as ideational creatures rather than as experiential creatures. You know, because uh, I think within. Uh, uh, human consciousness in the past, there always existed some sense of a, a collaborative um, existence uh, uh, with nature, with other beings of all kinds, uh, of all kinds, which was sort of systematically suppressed, you know, um, and suppressed, as you say, <laughs> most of all by the agency of men, uh, you know. Uh, so, how do we find our way back towards anything like that? Uh, I think that's the fundamental, uh, fundamental question that haunts uh, the writers of my generation. And uh, Richard Powers' overstory is a very powerful response to this question, because he basically, uh, you know, he's basically thinking of trees as beings, you know, uh, which they are. It's increasingly obvious that they are. And historians have always, I mean, you know, uh, humans have always known this, because you think of, let's say, the Buddha's enlightenment, you know, it's always throughout history been represented the Buddha sitting under a tree. I mean, the tree is inseparable from the enlightenment. So in a sense, and the Buddha himself at the end uh, uh, recognizes the tree as his partner in this. You know, so it's a collaborative. I mean, there already you see that there's an idea of a collaborative existence of a species as an assemblage rather than as a unique species. You know, and uh, I think it's... It's all of these issues that you're pointing to, because once you start down that road thinking that, you know, we are human only because only we think, uh, you know, and then, uh, then it goes on to becoming, uh, you know, I'm a human because I think and I want. So it becomes a sort of infinite regress. How do you work your way back from that? I think we all have to find our own answers. Thank you very much. Other questions? Okay, first here, and then I come over there. Thank you. Hi, my name is Angelita Covers. I was wondering, um, you were telling first about that the narrative of the uh, previous generation was about growth and about wealth, uh, whilst for the younger generation, it will be a less more um, beautiful future. Um, I was wondering, how do you think, well, what is your view for the future for the next generation? It's <laughs> narrative. Sounds a bit negative. No, that's a very good question. Look, uh, you know, I don't think that it's all, <laughs> uh, it's all bad or that it's all, uh, it's all changed. I, I mean, for myself, I can tell you that, you know, uh, an awareness of this literature, an awareness of what's out there in the world has made me appreciate so many things about life so much more. You know, uh, family, community, uh, all of those things have become so much more important. When you, I think when we confront something on this scale, it makes us ask ourselves, what are the values that are important? What do we actually live for? What, what matters? You know? And I think in a way we must count ourselves lucky that this question has been thrust upon us with such violence almost, you might say, that we have to ask ourselves these questions. I mean. What does it mean to, uh, to lead a meaningful life? I think human beings have always asked themselves that. But, uh, you know, we are at a point when everything around us tells us that a meaningful life is the life of consumption, uh, you know? So, in a way, we have to... All of us, in our own ways, has to find uh, answers to these questions. That what you're saying um, comes very much down also what has been written in the Middle Ages, for example, in Western society. Uh, in a way, you say, go beyond enlightenment. Go find the old sources back. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think it's not, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not surprising to me that uh, the most important document on climate change comes from uh, uh, Pope Francis, because in a way, he's able to draw upon pre-enlightenment traditions, you know, pre and it's interesting that, you know, for him, his uh, 
the saint that he most reveres is uh, Saint Francis of Assisi, uh, because I think he 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 has access uh, to traditions where perhaps that can help us see things in ways which are different from the ways in which we see them now. Okay, other question over here. I will hand you the mic. Hello, I'm uh, Peter Pelzer. Um, Hi. In the past, you've also written about the role of fossil fuels and relation between fossil fuels and culture, a petrofiction, as you dubbed it, petrocultures, as it's now increasingly called. May I ask you to relate this thinking about uh, fossil fuels um, to your kind of current diagnosis of our uh, predicament? Uh, it's not an uh, easy one, maybe. Uh, no, it's a very long one. Um, you know, the thing about fossil fuels is that we think of fossil fuels only as a source of energy. That's how we, you know. But fossil fuels are much more than that. And it's when you begin to see uh, that, um, when you begin to see this aspect of them, the imaginative aspect of fossil fuels, that you really realize, uh, you really begin to see the extent to which we are actually ruled by things of the earth, you know? Because, uh, you know, for us, fossil fuels is an entire imaginary. It's an imaginary of freedom, it's an imaginary of uh, well-being. Uh, when today people think of, uh, you know, well-being, it's always in terms of fossil fuels, you know? Uh, in terms of um, uh, energy consumption at a certain level, but also fossil fuels. I don't know if you heard about this, uh, uh, this thing that started happening in America, uh, where people uh, secretly attack uh, electric cars. They disfigure Teslas and other electric cars because they feel that as a kind of rebuke to their sensibility. You know, so you can see the sense in which uh, the contemporary sensibility has become so deeply enmeshed with fossil fuels that uh, to, di uh, to divorce from fos fossil fuels is not just a simple question of uh, replacing, uh, uh, replacing energy sources. There's something much more uncanny. You know, I mean, you just think of someone who sees a Tesla and wants to disfigure it because it's running, with, uh, running on el electricity. I mean, it's not that electricity, a lot of it comes from fossil fuels anyway. But <laughs> I mean, just the strangeness of that. Uh, I mean, it's a kind of mania, really. What else can you call it? But, uh, you know, uh, I mean, being uh, from different parts of the world, I can tell you that uh, uh, the, the romance of, with fossil fuels, which Europe is slowly getting over with, it's absolutely in full swing across Asia. Uh, everyone is absolutely in love with fossil fuels now. And do you think that more developing countries have the right to make the same mistakes as the West? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's, <laughs> does it ever appear as a right? I, I don't know what that is. Uh, I mean, at this point, it's really not so much as a, a right as an assertion. I mean, it, until the world changes, they will not change either. Other questions? Yeah, another one. Reacting on what you said about the attacks on uh, Teslas, uh, at least in Western Europe, um, dealing with climate change is very much seen as an elite project, whereas, of course, the consequences are um, for, the, uh, for the poorest people uh, much more severe. Um, so how can we, is there a way to harness the imagination, to, to use imagination to sort of change the issue so that it becomes more, becomes perceived as more than an elite project uh, by those who will be feeling the consequences? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, this, um, what happened in France uh, is actually a huge setback for uh, environmental movements, uh, you know. And it's really, uh, it's really a tragedy that President Macron uh, approached this issue in such a haphazard and, um, how shall I say, thoughtless way, uh, you know, uh, without providing any sorts of uh, cushionings for, um, uh, for poor people. I think it set back the whole, uh, the whole process by many, many years. So, yes, I mean, increasingly, the whole issue is presented as, a, as, a, um, as an elite project. 
at the same time, you know, uh, poor people around the world are also feeling the impact, you know, uh, in very direct ways. So, which way is it leading? I don't know. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ben. Uh, Hi. Thank you. I was just wondering, who else are you reading? <laughs> uh, you mean on uh, climate issues? Or? Yeah, or what authors are coming the closest, do you think, to capturing the issues in the way that you'd want to see? I, I would certainly say that uh, Richard uh, Powers' book has been, uh, I think, a real path breaker. I think it's a very, very important book and really points, uh, uh, points us in a different direction. Uh, but, you know, in different ways, there are other people who are approaching these issues uh, from different points of view, but which also reflect the nature of the problem. Uh, Jessamine Ward uh, in the United States, uh, she wrote about, um, you know, it's not about Hurricane Katrina, but it's set with the, um, Hurricane Katrina in the background. And there are a few others, if you like, Barbara Kingsolver, whose work I hugely admire. Um, and, uh, you know, the, uh, Annie Proulx, uh, who's very engaged with uh, climate change issues. Also, um, um, you know, the, uh, the Italian writer, the, I'm sorry, I'm just uh, blanking the name right now. Uh, she's just recently published some articles which are, which are very interesting. So it's not that there aren't, uh, that there aren't uh, a lot of people engaging with this, but the question that arises is why is this not the most important thing that everyone, that every writer engages with, you know? And I mean, that's really the pressing question. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing more important. And, you know, all the writers I've named are from, uh, from, the, from the Western world, but it doesn't mean that there aren't others. I mean, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's an author from Taiwan who wrote a wonderful book uh, called uh, The Man with Compound Eyes. I don't know if any of you have read it, but it's a really interesting book. Uh, then uh, many of you will know uh, Shat Singh's book, The Swarm. No, uh, it's in German, but it's a, <laughs> I think it's a wonderful novel. I mean, I don't know that it's a persuasive novel, but half of, at least half of it, I would say. Uh, I mean, I was just uh, enchanted by it. So, I mean, people are, are trying to approach, but uh, Shat Singh's book is very much in a science fiction tradition rather than, uh, you know, the work of powers, etc. So uh, there are uh, many, many uh, writers who are trying to uh, um, approach these issues in very interesting ways. Thank you so much. Some questions uh, here below. Please. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Um, another sort of fossil fuel related question. Um, uh, you were saying before that um, it's not about switching light bulbs, that actually we need something more powerful. Uh, and there was an article by Bill McKibben in Rolling Stone, Stone magazine, and he said, yes, it's not about green consumerism. We need, you know, a change in politics. And he mentioned, you know, fossil fuel companies as really being, well, the enemy, you know, the people who are stopping progress. And since then, that article really launched a whole climate activism movement in Europe, and there's been real, you know, coal mines been shut down in Germany, for example, and so on. And uh, there's been a great divestment movement where trillions are divested from fossil fuels. And my question is, is this narrative of fossil fuel companies being the enemy, is this a limited narrative when you consider that it's been a very successful one in mobilizing a movement? Because having something as an enemy is maybe a bit dualistic or a bit too simple. Uh, I have the greatest respect for Bill McKibben. And I think what he's been doing with 350.org is really remarkable. And, uh, uh, you know, I completely support it. I think it's uh, really wonderful, the work he's doing. And, you know, it's some place. It's something to do. It's some place to begin. I mean, you know... As human beings, we need that. You know, we need a sense of so, sort of engagement with this. And I think uh, to engage with divestment and 350.org, all of it is very, very important. And uh, I urge uh, anyone, uh, you know, who, who feels powerless or whatever, uh, to engage with these, uh, with these movements. I think they're very powerful. But, you know, that's the part of me that, that's, that, that thinks that we must engage with this. But there is another part of me which says, uh, uh, Let's be realistic. I mean, suppose there was a complete uh, uh, shutdown in fossil fuels uh, immediately. Uh, what would be the result? I mean, as I said, you know, uh, cement 
is, this, is a very important source of greenhouse gas emissions. And I don't know if you've noticed this, uh, but I can tell you everywhere in the world that I go, oh, you just look around you and you can see these vast towers of cement coming up all around you. And this is especially true of Asia. I think these cement lobbies have absolutely a stranglehold upon the world. I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's surprising that the, you know, the president of the United States is a real estate person. I think real estate, uh, this real estate industry, the building inst industry, the construction industry, uh, they just have a stranglehold up, uh, upon the world. And they just throw every problem they see, cement is the answer. So for example, you know, all the sort of uh, water scarcity issues across Asia, what are they doing? This whole push to build dams, where do you think this comes from? Dams are just giant uh, uh, walls of cement, you know? And this is, uh, I mean, Trump, one of the reasons why he's so keen to build this wall, he says, is because he loves cement. <laughs> and he wants to put up more cement, you know? So you can see the insidious hold. I mean, you know, we talk about the sort of uh, uh, power of the fossil fuel industry, but I think cement is uh, just as uh, uh, scary and frightening. That's one thing. The second thing is, you know, you look at, uh, you look at, you know, the sources of greenhouse gas emissions. And I, I know that people always try to break it down to flying or, uh, or cars or whatever. But, you know, the single largest source, actually, aggregate, is military. 25% uh, of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions comes from, uh, comes from military uh, deployments. You know, in a single year, uh, the U.S., uh, in its uh, military deployments in the Middle East, uh, releases more greenhouse gas than an entire nation of Bangladesh, uh, with 180 million people. You just think about it in F-16. If you look at the amount of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions that come from, let's say, uh, uh, an aircraft carrier. An aircraft carrier... Uh, uh, releases more greenhouse gases than an entire town of uh, 4,000 people in the US. And um, uh, an F-16 in one hour releases more greenhouse gases than uh, an aircraft carrier in, uh, you know, uh, over 24 hours. So, you know, you think of all those, you think of all those military things that are out there. And if, again, you look at the, you look at the graphs, the only graph that really matches greenhouse gas emissions, the rise in greenhouse gas emissions, is uh, defense expenditure. You know, they are both uh, hockey sticks. So what, what, what answer can you take from that? You know... Make love, not cement. Uh, the answer really is that uh, uh, people talk about a governmental response to climate change. And this is the response. Governments across the world are arming themselves to their teeth because they can see, or they can see, you know, how unstable the world is going to become. Amitav, I have another question here. Yeah, can we uh, expect more more Asian writers coming up talking about these issues? I'm glad you asked that question because actually uh, I named a lot of writers, uh, but almost all of them are Westerners. And, uh, you know, this is, a, this is a very curious thing. I mean, in Asia, uh, Asia is very vulnerable. Uh, there are really no denialists as such that I've come across in Asia. Everybody knows, uh, you know, what this is. But amongst the, amongst the younger writers, and I, I can really perhaps only speak for India, but amongst the younger writers, I don't see that there's uh, that sort of engagement. Uh, with these issues, I mean, the younger writers in India are really overwhelmingly interested in urban matters, in identity issues, in, you know, gender issues and so on, all of which are very important, but, uh, you know, not with this. And I, can t uh, I was in China for a while, uh, and, uh, you know, the Chinese uh, j uh, journalists who would come to interview me, they all seemed completely astonished that I was interested in, that, you know, <laughs> that I was engaged with climate change. So, okay, thank you. Uh, there was a hand back there, but yeah. yeah. Uh, Michael Schwartz. Um, of course, I'm not going to deny that climate change is a global magnitude, but isn't there a danger that 
and I admire the way with imagination and your writing and others to shift the narrative as long as we keep trapped in that globalist uh, modernist view of climate change instead of breaking it down to the human stories that you come up with yourself you. that that may be much more the inroad that we can change the narrative rather than attack it as changing a narrative of the global climate crisis thank you uh, yeah I, I i agree and uh, really um, uh, you know as a uh, as a single um, a writer that's all you can do but i i, I must say that it's a uh, in, in its own way, uh, just as a writer approaching, the, uh, approaching these issues, it's also very exciting, you know? It, it makes you have to reach into different parts of your imagination, you know? Um, and I, that is, uh, that is uh, very exciting. But again, you know, I think uh, uh, the, uh, the question over there is really so important because uh, you know, there was a time when, I mean, this issue, I mean, the whole climate, thing comes to us as a problem created by the West. I mean, that's, it's that simple. But today, it's no longer within the West's power to solve this problem. You know, any solution that doesn't appeal to Asians and Africans, any solution that doesn't take them along is not a solution. It's not going to work, you know? OK, there was one other question here. Yeah, OK. What makes it so hard, do you think, for artists or writers to deal with this issue? And uh, what, what do you think they will need to start working on, on this issue? Again, you know, it's not that artists and writers don't, are not producing the work. It's to do with the ecosystem. I mean, you know, I know artists who produce what looks to me like wonderful work that's related to climate, you know. But are they the ones for which... Uh, People will pay millions of dollars. Are they the ones who get the big uh, exhibitions? No. I mean, uh, in New York, which is in many ways the center of the art world, uh, there have been a couple of, uh, uh, of uh, exhibitions and shows on, uh, on climate change. But they're not by no means the ones that get written up. Uh, they're by no means the ones that, uh, that reviewers engage with. See, you know, Within at least the New York art world, ever since abstract expressionism and conceptualism and so on, you can see with abstract expressionism, conceptualism, more and more it's abstractions, you know? It's a retreat into the human mind, uh, you know? That's where the creative space seems to lie. So for um, today's art critics, when they see a work that engages with something that's not inside the human mind, uh, what do they call it? They call it illustrative you know, which is just about the most damning thing you can say in today's art world, you know? So it just goes to show the ways in which we are digging our own graves, you know, it's in multiple ways. I mean, art historically has always shown us uh, the realities of the world, but today they can't because they'd be dismissed. Um, last question? Yeah. Okay, when? one moment. When is your next book novel coming? Uh, it's coming out in June, actually. <laughs> and we're talking a novel? It is a novel, yes. Okay, yes, good. It is a novel. Uh, you could also call it a hybrid genre, I don't know, but uh, yeah. Okay. Well, Amitav, first of all, thank you uh, to the audience, because I think it, again, shows the wisdom of the crowd. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much for these very engaged and interesting questions. And thank you so very much for um, uh, reflecting upon this, uh, this issue by also mirroring sometimes back yes. and lay the answer uh, to the question uh, towards the individual. Thank you for that as well. Thank you. And, uh, well, courage for the upcoming days. You will be in Maastricht on um, the 25th of January, 26th, yes. 25th, yeah, where you get, yeah, 20, 23rd and 24th on, or 5th. Okay. Yeah. Where you will be having uh, uh, this uh, beautiful um, honor of uh, become uh, one of the it's an honorary um, doctorate, yes. Um, we, uh, of course, uh, already uh, give our uh, honor to that as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. And again, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>
Patrick Bart, so if you want to meet up and ask questions, he will be available for the next 15 minutes or so. Yep.